right. Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Um, wherever you are in the world, welcome uh, to the gathering here. And we are going to uh, we are going to um, just welcome all those who have joined us for the first time here. Um, and to see everybody from around the world is wonderful. Um, if you're watching this by a video and you'd like to come and join us, just go to rivershabbat.com and uh, scroll down and hit that welcome to the river. There's a subscribe button there. And if you hit that, it'll just ask you to put a first and a last name in and an email and hit subscribe. And that'll put you on our weekly newsletter and give you a link to the live gatherings, uh, and the live Shabbat gatherings with us at River Shabbat. If you've never come and joined us live, uh, you're more than welcome to. We'd love to see you. Okay. Well, we are here once again, and uh, we are on the lead up here to the week of unleavened bread. And um, I know we got lots of terms for these things and whatnot, but we're going to keep it to the Torah. It's the week of unleavened bread. And, um, and so I've got here the hidden prophecies. And of course, uh, anybody who knows the teachings and understandings uh, uh, over the years uh, would know that uh, everything that I believe scripture is pointing to and talking about and what we saw almost 2000 years ago, the early Kahol, the early church, and of course, uh, Messiah, and, uh, and those that were delivered in the great shadow picture uh, of the Pesach and delivered out of bondage in, uh, in Egypt. We have these incredible sets of spring and fall appointed times, all of them of which point to Messiah. And so the hidden prophecies um, that sit within understanding the framework of his appointed times, his Moedim, um, is how he actually wanted us to understand the great plan of redemption. And so uh, there's neat things, neat pearls and things to find, uh, you know, when we uh, start to understand it the way he wanted us to. And then we kind of get this a whole sort of scenario, you know, what is actually his word? And the instructions of Torah. So many of us face this um, when we come in and uh, into the faith and we start to look at it a bit deeper and whether we've come from the Christian side of the river or the Jewish side of the river. And we come into the living waters, the living waters of life, and we revisit these things. Um, sometimes if we've come from the Christian side, we might be uh, considering uh, the Torah now from a first person and not a third person perspective. And so there's lots of challenges and things we've worked through. And many of you uh, are either just starting that journey or have been on that journey for many years uh, or um, uh, have been in a place where this is something that um, you started to realize looking at your faith a bit deeper that the instructions of Torah, uh, if they don't remain a dead word um, and, uh, and our focus and the understanding of why we we're giving them becomes alive, um, we start to realize there's an incredible richness to our faith and a faith um, like no other. Uh, on all of earth, we, we have the faith and uh, we start to realize this as we look deeper. Uh, at his appointed times. As I always do at this time of the year, um, we look at, uh, you know, going back and we look at the week, uh, the spring Moedim, and we do this in the fall, and we look at it from sort of different angles and different understandings. We revisit. It says in scripture that we are actually to proclaim these, okay? So uh, in Leviticus 23, 1, 2, it says, and Yah spoke to Moshe saying, speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, the appointed uh, say unto them concerning the appointed times of Yah, which you shall proclaim to be holy gatherings or holy convocations. These are my appointed times. And I always make the point uh, during this, not only to not only do we as a community do what Torah is instructed here, that we are to proclaim them in season. So this isn't a time of the year to be you know, marching with our various religious agendas or whatever it might be, or, you know, some sort of random thing that we want to share or talk about uh, that the Father may have revealed or given to us in the Word. We have particular instructions to actually proclaim these appointed times uh, as we come in and during these seasons. And so we want to focus on uh, um, as instructed by Torah. Now, one of the things 
that's that I point out every year is that they are his appointed times. They are not ours. And so this is going to really bring challenges to us um, in the sense of our journeys. We have all experienced uh, going through learning and understanding as we look deeper at the faith, and then we can be lured into certain things and we can turn his appointed times into ours, can't we? And, uh, and hands up if anybody has been guilty of a little bit of that in your life, <laughs> that somehow, you know, as we're learning this, we kind of try to tend to do things and justify things and whatever it might be. But really, what is the Torah actually saying? And so there's a number of challenges here because he's making the statement, proclaim them in season and remember they are mine. They are not yours, our Christian brothers and sisters, and my to my Jewish brothers and sisters, they are not yours either. They are his. He means what he says and says what he means. And he's saying that in the Torah. And he said this thousands of years ago, instructed to the house of Israel. Let us take that very sobering as we look at certain things. Because we're all going to be challenged uh, as a result of that. And every year, many of you that have been on this journey for a while know this. And every time you get to a point where you think, okay, I got this, you know, <laughs> he reveals something else concerning his appointed times. And so that's why we are to look at it uh, every year, because we are fallen creatures and we need to ponder things, the questions of Elohim. We need his understanding. Um, and, and we also uh, need his Ruach to reveal these things. Um, and so as a part of that, the Ruach brings us into visiting these things every year as commanded by the Torah, because we need repetition. We need to revisit these things uh, so that we can continue to grow and prosper in the faith. One of the things to understand is a point in times here, and I've got Israel is his people, not a modern uh, United Nations state. And so even though um, uh, we love our Jewish brethren in the land right now or in a portion of the land, um, but the Elohim is dealing with his scattered tribes across the earth. And so this includes all the Middle East. It includes all the continents. It includes to where, just as the prophet has said, his people have been scattered across the world. So we need to understand that if, if we don't understand Israel as his people, we won't understand the prophecies or the great plan of redemption. And so I remind people this time of the year, it's very important um, that when you understand your identity is actually Israel and you start to look at that, he only calls his house Israel. He doesn't call it anything else. It quite clearly says in his word, my house is called the house of Israel. And what makes up his house are his people. Now, Israel has been promised a land, and we see the shadow pictures of all that, and it's going to come to this great final conclusion in the last great day in this thousand-year reign of Messiah. And we're going to look at a little something here today, because I believe the spring appointed times is also pointing to this. And, uh, and we often don't see or think about these things. And one of the reasons is because we're learning just to honor this in a way that actually reflects what the Torah is saying. And when we do that, it unlocks certain things that we have not seen or these things that are hidden to our eyes. It says that both our Jewish brethren and our Christian brethren in this scattered reality across the world are both going to see dimly. And they're going to sort of come together and they're going to kind of need each other. But we're both going to have to get the leaven out of the house. Both sides. We have a king that has taken the scepter. He's ascended the throne. He is the authority. And so we actually need to help each other to come together with what he has given us that we both see dimly, that we will see fully together and hear the instructions of the authority from the throne. And so this is a part of this whole journey. Everything in, the, in his appointed times is ultimately about Messiah, King, and a groom. His ancient plan of redemption and a great ancient Hebrew marriage covenant. So, we are here. And I've got the little chart here. And uh, almost uh, 2,000 years ago, Bible prophecy was fulfilled physically, literally by Messiah and was then set in motion. So it became uh, fulfilled in this living sense. And so he fulfilled it 
and he's going to fulfill his fall Moedim, the same pattern he gave us. We don't get to change this and bring in all our, all our, um, you know, in my statement of, you know, bad hermeneutics equals bad eschatology. We don't get to change this. This is how and the pattern he gave us. He's filled the spring Moedim in sequence as it was laid down in Torah to the day within the same year. And he asks us to honor it that way as well. And so this is the pattern he gave us and we will head for the fall Moedim after this and he will do the same thing. He will honor it within the same year in sequence to the day. He gave us the pattern of how this is physically going to be fulfilled. And then spiritually, this is going to be brought together uh, into the final age and as we go into eternity. So we have a physical fulfillment and the spiritual fulfillment. And so in the physical, this is the pattern he lays down. And so if we understand this at this time, which the, you know, the, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes and whatnot did not see something at this time, almost 2000 years ago. And so they did not recognize that this was Messiah. And so apparently this is going to happen again when we see the full Moedim physically and literally fulfilled on earth. And there's once again going to be his people who are going to be fooled. But his bride will not be. So the Moedim all speak from a time domain perspective. They do not speak anything to do of eternity. They are called the appointed times. Time is a physical property and is about our uh, time, literally in the time domain. And so a lot of this has been taken out of context. And so we want to know that the father set a motion and plan, a 7,000 year plan of redemption, and it is all time perspective. It is time domain uh, in its nature. And so we don't get to take things outside the time domain when it comes to understanding his appointed times. And so this, again, is a, a big mistake that many uh, make, particularly uh, hermeneutically, uh, when it comes to understanding scripture uh, and these appointed times. So these harvests basically focus around these two things. In the spring, it is, is the wheat and barley harvests. And so these are all a part, the harvest of his great plan of redemption. This is what it's pointing to. And the agriculture is teaching us. In the spring, it is focused around the barley and the wheat. And then, of course, in the fall, it's around the grapes, the figs, uh, pomegranates, olives, uh, all these things, and also nuts. Um, we got plenty of that right now in these last days. Uh, it's sorry, the end, of the, in the end of the age here. But these are how he sets his calendar. He has a solar, lunar, and agricultural calendar, and he is fulfilling all of this that way. This is what he gave us for the time domain to understand so many things. And then, of course, we've got the fall appointed times. And uh, like I said, they will be physically, literally fulfilled um, in the pattern that he gave us. So I've got here. Look at me. I'm so holy. We're so set apart. And whether we, whatever side of the river we've been on, we tend to, uh, you know, we've been of the faith in our faith journey and we tend to, and, and maybe some of you have been guilty of this. I know I have in the past where you get to a point where you think, okay, I got this, you know, this is my understanding, you know, and you might have your Christian understanding. You might have your Jewish understanding and you sit there and you can almost have this thing. Well, I've kind of got it all. I don't need to know anymore. And then many of you had your eyes opened and you started to realize, wait a minute, no, there are things here I don't understand and there is things that I don't see and there are things I have to relearn and, to, uh, and get on. And all of this is pointing to our leaven in our house, our spiritual adultery, our spiritual leaven in the house. Leaven is not you know, we make this, you know, it's all my struggles in the flesh, you know, and if I just stop behaving badly like this in the flesh, then I'm fine. I've got the leaven out. This tends to be more of a Christian uh, perspective. 
And so what happens is your focus all becomes about you and it becomes about your struggles and your struggles in the flesh and everything. And what you're doing is you're getting your eyes focused on your fallen state. And this is exactly the opposite of what Yeshua and, and the great apostle Paul actually pointed to is that no, that is actually the roots. You need to get yourself focused on something else. And so this is what uh, we can end up being when we go and march along our faith and we think we've got it all sorted out as a Christian or in modern Judaism. And we start to live this perspective. Well, I'm the believer, I'm of the faith and all these, you know, unholy pagans and whatnot out there, they've all got it wrong. And then suddenly you've been on this journey where the father's opening your eyes and going, well, wait a minute, you're the one that claims the faith, not them. And he starts to humble us and he starts to show us and to share with us these different things. So what's wrong with a little leaven? I mean, come on. Donkey, you know, why, you know <laughs> surely we can have a little bit of this in the house. So here's, we got the Christian perspective and it's extreme here. Messiah died so I can have my traditions. That's why he died. It's been done away with. All of this, this law, this Torah and whatnot. And so you might've been raised in this and then in its fullest expression, it gets into some real weirdness now. What does it actually look like when it comes to this time of the year on that side of the river bank? And then we get this side, we honor Torah, but only with a little of our own traditions. I mean, it's just a little bit. We've just, you know, we're honoring it, but you know, we do all this other stuff too. And what's wrong with that? What's wrong with doing that? Well, there's two sides of this that only see dimly. And as a result of seeing dimly, we kind of fill the gaps with what we don't see with what we want or what we think. And we end up with Jewish and Christian Talmud, the teachings, the precepts of men. Christian brothers and sisters, Paul speaking to the Galatians and nothing new under the sun. He was dealing with something almost 2000 years ago, and we're dealing with it today from the Christian side in particular. You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? So he's seen something creep into the Galatians, into the faith. This persuasion is not from him who calls you. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. So when we go through and we learn certain things about, you know, um, if we're on the Christian side, you know, Jesus died for our sins and all these sorts of things. And then slowly but surely we start picking up all this other stuff. And as a result, our whole faith gets leavened. And this has happened with vast portions of, you know, the 30,000 plus denominations of Christianity. And so we've ended up in something that's not looking so good. Uh, if we're honest with it. But on the other side, Messiah is speaking, and he's dealing with the Pharisees and the scribes. And they came to Yeshua in Jerusalem, and they said, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? Notice it's not break the Torah. Why do they break the traditions of the elders? So they're actually upset with him. For they do not wash their hands when they eat. So this was one of the traditions that they had brought in. Um, and the point here that Yeshua is making it's not just tr all tradition is bad in the sense of, you know, the little things that we have in our lives. But this is very directly related to an accusation from the religious system that you are not doing our Talmud. And they're saying this to Messiah. And he answered them, why do you break the commandment of Elohim for the sake of your tradition? So as the leaven gets, you know, as the, uh, the uh, leaven leavens our whole lump of bread, we are going to possibly, again, fill in the gaps, bring in our own things to the point where we will not see the why. We will get caught up in the what's. And on both sides of the river, I see a lot of the faith or the so-called faith and the claim of the faith um, being caught up in this. And so many of you that have been on Messianic and Hebrew roots movements and things like that, you have been caught up in these things too. 
it was passed down to you. And if you come from the Christian side and they end up in Messianic and some of the Hebrew movement side, now you're all of a sudden picking up all these traditions. And now suddenly the weight of this, and this is why it says you can become twice the child of Sheol. Because you still haven't got the Christian leaven out of the house. Now we brought a whole bunch of more leaven into the house. And now we're all sitting here. And of course, it doesn't make for a very nice witness, a very good witness. Unless we enter into a place of repentance, shuv. And then we can start to see and revisit the things that we think we know. But unless we get this leaven out of our house, it's going to be very hard to hear and to see. It got so bad that on the island of Patmos, this mystery Babylon, this wicked woman that we've been talking about in the Proverbs series, it got so bad that the apostle John trusted with actually writing what he heard and saw in the book of Revelation, the revelation of Yeshua HaMashiach. It was so bad that John didn't even understand what he was looking at. He's actually looking at that which claims the faith and these visions given to him imprisoned on the island of Patmos, and he doesn't know what he's seeing. Is this the faith? How can this be? How can this be so? What is happening here? What really is happening here? What is this leaven? What did John see to a point where he marvels greatly. It says, on her forehead was written the name of mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes. So it's a mother of something. It's going to give birth to something. Of the earth's abominations. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and the blood of the martyrs of Yeshua. When I saw her, I marveled greatly. So it appears that those that would get the leaven out of the house, that would stand up truly for this great plan of redemption, that would push away and get, get this leaven out, get the traditions out and whatnot, apparently there's going to be a religious system that turns on those people. And there's going to be much blood as a result of that. And indeed, the last 2,000 years has been a witness of that. But the interesting thing here is, is that Mar what John was given a vision of concerning the people of Messiah actually marveled him greatly. He did not recognize it. He did not understand it. How could it look like this? Do we end up with a focus on the what and not the why in our lives? And is it possible that no matter what way it looks, be it comical, be it, you know, reverent and holy, is it possible that no matter what the look is, no matter what dress she is wearing, that this little leaven can come in and actually affect our hearing and our eyesight concerning the great plan of redemption and concerning our Messiah? And so we, in the face, we tend to get caught up on either side of the river. We tend to get caught up in the what's. You know, and if I just do my communion or if I just go to my Sunday church or if I just honor Christmas or I just do my Easter or whatever, or if I just get do my setter at at uh, um, at Pesach and if I just make sure that, you know, I'm wearing the right things or, you know, saying the name right or I've got the shape of the earth right or I've, you know, whatever it might be, my calendar is right, you know, and you end up in this whole space where something's just leavening the lump. And every year he's wanting us to come back to something and say, I, I want you to consider what's gotten into us because this knowledge, this traditions, this leaven, this Talmud of man is puffing you up and it's going to bring division and it's going to bring strife. And again, as we've brought this into the Proverbs series, this is not a good place to be because ultimately we will bring violence to the Sabbath itself on his Sabbaths, both in the appointed times and the weekly Sabbath. Seven annual, one weekly. So why then do we tend to focus on what not to do when he does open our eyes and ears? When, they're, when our eyes and ears uh, are open spiritually, why do we focus on the not? Many of you will be able to relate to this. When your eyes were open to certain things, 
you went about looking at, okay, I'm looking at these appointed times. Now, maybe these things have some merit. <laughs> and all of a sudden it's like, okay, I better not do this. Don't do this. Don't eat this. Don't touch this. And you're going through this. And this was spoken about in the early Kahal almost 2000 years ago as well. They were facing it. And so your focus became on what not to do so that you could get it right. And if you do that long enough, you will start putting tradition and Talmud and barriers in place and place and place just to make sure that you don't get it wrong. Now, our intent, don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying that our intent as our eyes are being opened and as we want to seek to honor the Father, whether it be on the Christian side or the Jewish side, that our intent is not good. But if we could win this, if we could do this on our good intentions, we would not need his Ruach. We would not need his truth. We would just need our good intentions. Paul says this, knowing what we just spoke about here. He says in Philippians 4, 8, 9, he says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, this more excellent way, is there anything worthy of praise? Think about these things. Who is worthy of praise? Ultimately, what is Paul talking about here? Because his focus doesn't appear to be on the what not to do. What you have learned and received. So to all of you in the community, you have learned and received. You're learning and receiving something now at this time as we come to the end of the age. I encourage you. Receive it. Learn it. You don't have to justify. You don't have to defend. Does everybody know that Elohim is big enough to defend himself? <laughs> you do realize you have an Elohim. He's the creator of the universe. He doesn't need you to defend him. He actually needs us to listen to him. And so that's the journey that we're all on. We're all having our eyes and our ears open that we may listen to him. And to receive and heard and seen in me, practice these things. So, so the Apostle Paul is demonstrating, he's doing something, he's saying, come on, we've got to get our focus in the right place because our fallen state will focus on the not. You know, you tell a child, parents, right? Don't touch this, don't touch that. What does the child do? Immediately. What have you just told the child to do? And they're touching everything. What if Paul and what he's saying here is the exhorting is he's focusing and his focus is actually the appointed times. It's actually the framework given to us. Focus on what is his, not on what you're should, you know, not doing or not need not to do or the things you have been doing. Be in a place of repentance because when you're turned to what is right, what is pure, what is holy, what is just, when you return to him and his ways, we have our focus not on us, but on him. And as our focus is on him, we receive these things. Paul and Yeshua lived them daily at the heart level. What they lived at the heart level was the appointed times, the great plan of redemption. They were not just referencing them in the what's. And they did many a time. If you understand, Yeshua and Paul are speaking the appointed times right throughout this thing we call the New Testament or the Brit Hadashah. Most of our Christian brethren do not understand this. And he's doing this. And this is with their correction, reproof, and revelation. It was the source of the wisdom they were demonstrating. Paul had to go through a Damascus Road experience and then actually go away and revisit everything he knew. And believe me, if you think you know the Torah better than the Apostle Paul, you truly are deluded. And yet he needed a Damascus Road experience and needed to go away and revisit what he thought he knew and to actually unlearn the way he knew it. Not the what he knew, the way he had learned it. And so this was happening to a religious system that knows the Torah, practiced the what of the Torah better than any of us today. And one of the greatest uh, teachers and highest elevated people in this system needed to actually go away and get the leaven out of his house and needed a Damascus Road experience to do it. But I guess we're all fine almost 2,000 years later. 
because everybody here that gathers, we all got our leaven out of the house, right? We're all good. It's just that, that bad apostle Paul, he needed it. Not, you know, it was those bad Pharisees and said they needed it, not us. And so this is where we can end up with, you know, this whole, well, I'm all set apart. It's everybody else is the problem as we read scripture third person. In, in the Torah here, in Deborah Rame 16, 16, it says this, three times a year, all your males shall appear before Yah, your Elohim, at the place that he will choose. Now, at the time, he had chosen, obviously, going to Jerusalem and the temple. But notice that that's being left open for the whole of the plan of redemption because he was going to tear down the temple. And this is being referenced or a hint to it right back in the Torah. He will choose. Well, what if he chose you? So getting out of honoring these is not the issue. He gets to choose where it is. And where this was established at the time, of course, was going to Jerusalem and the temple and honoring the feast. But he's leaving this. He will choose it. And he will choose it through all of the time domain. He has the right to do this. Why? Because he is Elohim. And we are not. It says here, choose the feast of unleavened bread at the feast of Shavuot and at the feast of Sukkot or Tabernacles. They shall not appear before you empty handed. What is this? Empty hammock. In the Hebrew, the rach, here or rach, empty, vain, idle, worthless. So you're not to appear to him on these times as we honor him in this idle or worthless state. Empty handed, nothing in our hands. And we're going to see here in the unleavened bread what is actually going on because there's an incredible um, time which is not a holy convocation that actually gives us a hint to something that is occurring right during the week of unleavened bread. Many of us miss something here. The root of this is ruch in Hebrew, to make empty, empty out, to empty, to keep empty or hungry, to pour out or down, to be emptied out. Okay, so we're to do this where he chooses and we're not to be empty handed when we do this. We are not to appear before to appear before him in Iraq or rake. So how are we to honor the week of unleavened bread now that Messiah has come and fulfilled it then? I mean, donkey, you're saying that he fulfilled this literally in the flesh. So how are we to do this now? How are we to honor this now? Many of you have had this question. We get to these times of the year and you go, well, how am I supposed to do? You know, you start to revisit and go, I, I thought this is how I was supposed to do the Passover. I thought this is how I was supposed to do first fruits, or this is how I was supposed to do the last seven day or the Shavuot or the appointment. You go through this every year going, because in you now, what's starting to happen is the why starting to matter. And you're starting to care. It's not just what I'm doing now. You're actually starting to care why I'm doing it. And is this actually pleasing to the Father? And this is a beautiful thing. And we are seeing this happen in the wider community at a level I have never seen in my whole walk. In my whole journey, we are actually starting to see people now ask the why, and they're not doing it because they just want to tick a box and be technically accurate. They're doing it because they actually want to honor him. The focus is no longer on the religious system or on self. It's actually starting to come about. It's actually Messiah I wish to honor. And what a beautiful thing that is to see in this community. It's incredible. I have never seen anything like this on such a scale. And I want to encourage you. This is a good thing to be going on inside you. Even if you have all this knowledge and you're, you know, you're supposedly doing it all right and you know what to do and all that sort of thing. If you can keep this, if you can grasp and hang on to this, even though you're in a fallen state, you will start to focus on what Paul was saying on what is right, what is pure, what is holy, not on what not to do and be running around going, why didn't anybody share this with me when I was growing up or when I was learning? Many of you have gone through that. You've asked that. Maybe some of you even got angry. Why wasn't I told? You should have been. These were all the, the teachers and the pastors and the rabbis. They should have told you. Why didn't they? Is it possible that they didn't see? 
is it possible they were in the Watts and they actually just told you the Watts and to stay in the Watts and then added some tradition and Talmud onto that. And then you get to pick that up too. Is, is what happened to you and to me exactly what the scripture says happens? Is it telling, did it tell us the truth? Ponder that. Because in my life, I read the scripture now and I go, this is telling the truth. This is exactly what happened to me. <laughs> now, maybe that wasn't you. Maybe you got it right coming out of the womb and you were perfect, but I wasn't. And so I had to go through this journey. And I have to revisit this according to the Torah every year. So again, we are arriving at this time, and now I'm starting to look at my house, not everyone else's house. In the Torah in Leviticus, it says this, 23, 4, 7, these are the appointed times of Yah, the holy gatherings or convocations, which you shall proclaim at the time appointed for them. On the first month of the 14th day of the month at twilight is Yah's Passover. We are now approaching the eve of the Pesach meal. This is his Passover. What is this about? On the 15th day of the same month and the feast of unleavened bread to Yah, for seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Now on the knots, and I went through this last year and I point out certain things. And one of the things that I pointed out last year is you all got focused on not eating leavened bread for a week, didn't you? But you know, I know many people that go, I didn't eat any unleavened bread this week. I didn't do that. And I asked them the question, well, did you eat? Uh, sorry, I didn't eat any leavened bread this week. And then I asked the question, did you eat unleavened bread every day this week? You see, that's how easy this can happen. And I have brothers and sisters every year and they go, oh, no, no, I just fasted yesterday. Or no, no, I did that. I'm going, well, does it instruct you to do that? No, but so you fasted that day. I guess, you know, you were being with good intentions, respectful to Yah and trying to really honor him during this time. But I say to them, what some of the Torah says, the Torah says to eat unleavened bread every day. It doesn't tell you to fast. Except at one little part during this week, we're going to talk about this. There's a reason for it. Is it a contradiction? Or is there something for us to understand as a part of this? On the first day, you shall have a set of park gathering. You shall do no, uh, do any ordinary work. Okay. So again, we've got our weekly Shabbat and we've got seven annual appointed times. And we are now starting the first of the annual appointed times and its starting gun is the Pesach meal. There is no, according to Leviticus 23, and you'll need to go through this, there is no Moedim called Passover. There is a Moedim called the Week of Unleavened Bread. And it has two high Sabbaths in it on day one and day seven. It commences with a Pesach meal. Why have we turned this into all, oh, I celebrate Passover? This has happened. We honor, you know, it's not what goes into a man, it's what comes out that dishonors it. We're saying this stuff. It's just coming out of us. Oh, I'm honoring the week of Passover. Is there a week of Passover? Or is there a week of unleavened bread? So easily, these things will come out of us. What is the Torah actually saying? And then how do we look at it in today's terms? So again, I'm bringing... And looking at this with the theme of some hidden prophecies that are in here. But if we don't take these mysteries and have a practical application in our life, then many of us are left floundering. And then that's when we can pick up a lot of these other things. So I always say every year, and you'll know this, the freezer of our lives. And I always do this afterwards so that uh, so I can catch people out. I'm not going to do that this year. I'm going to be, I'm going to be a good boy. And 
we are going to give the heads up on this. So you go around and sometimes people say, well, I've just, I've not ate any unleavened bread, but you still got it in your house some way, shape or form. So the freezer of our lives, you can always catch people out on every year. But many of you know what I get up to. So, you know, there's no way that's catching you out anymore. Um, and then we've got the toasters of our lives. So you think, oh, I got the freezer. Now it's like, you know, and I go, oh, well, go check your toaster. You know, you didn't get it all out. There's still a bit of 11 in that in that house, you know, and you, you catch them out, you know, and, and it's only to make a point right in these in these sorts of ways. But we go through these things and you go, well, I'm not had any leavened bread. I'm not eating any leavened bread. Oh, no, nope, there's none in my freezer. And then all of a sudden the toaster gets raised. Right. And it's like, oh. And so these are shadow pictures, modern day parables and shadow pictures to show you, do you really have all the leaven out of the house? Do you, Curtis? And so I, I'm giving you the journey I've actually gone through in my life, just so you know. <laughs> all right. Some of you might be able to relate. What about the vacuum of our lives? So now you think, okay, I'm good. No unleavened bread. No, nothing in the freezer. Nothing in the toaster. And okay. And we can go take a look at the vacuums. And let's just see what we got sitting in there. I sucked it all up. Oh, yeah. You didn't remove it from your house. All this journey, by the way, so far, we're all so holy, aren't we? I'm getting it right now. I got it. There's no leaven in here. And if leaven has to do with spiritual adultery, as I'm proposing, this knowledge that puffs us up, what are these little shadow pictures teaching us about ourselves? And then you get there, and then you got this one. What about the drive through of your lives. Do you know that I have seen people going through this and this actually happened to me one year, many years ago, and I'm so busy getting everything done. And I just was hungry during the middle of the week. And it took me having to be handed leaven for me to realize what I'd just done. And I realized that the person serving at this fast food restaurant was Satan. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> it was me, just how easily I could accept something. And I had to reject the meal. <laughs> and I'm like, is it that easy? And it is. So, again, maybe none of you can relate to this, but this is things that have happened to me. And the Torah here in Exodus is this, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, which we've talked about. And on the seventh day shall be a feast to Yah. So we'll be coming together for that with ministering to the king this year. Unleavened bread shall be eaten for seven days. Okay, now we got that one, right? So we're, we are literally very clear Eat unleavened bread seven days. It's now we've got three witnesses of this in the Torah. Eat unleavened every day. Eat unleavened every day. Okay. No leavened bread shall be seen with you. And no leaven shall be seen with you in all your territory. So within the boundaries of your house. So this is why I've been doing this right even through to the drive throughs <laughs> All right. Just because you're away from your home doesn't mean you can go to the drive through so you shall tell your son on that day, it is because of what Yah did for me when I came out of Egypt, this deliverance of bondage. So when we're eating this, when we're doing this, we've been delivered from bondage. Okay, there's a delivery to the house of Israel. If you understand that you're Israel and you understand that Israel is his people. We're being delivered from bondage. We're in the bondage of the time domain, our fallen state. We're under rule of the God of this world, and we're experiencing this bondage. And what he's doing is he's delivering us. The truth will set us free as a part of the state. So everything that is in these appointed times is speaking to Messiah and about Messiah setting us free. And it's going to literally play out through his appointed times in go into its final spiritual fulfillment. But it all starts with this. It is because of what Yah did for me when I came out of Egypt. Okay, so when you're cleaning out your toaster and you're not uh, on day one here and you're doing this. Now, the other one that we catch people out on, we talk about this, this day, 
In Exodus 14 to 15, it shall be a memorial day for you. Shall keep it as a feast to Yah throughout your generations as a statue forever. You shall keep it as a feast. So if you identify the house of Israel, we are still to honor it to this day. But not just the what? Seven days you should eat unleavened bread. Now we got four witnesses of this. Every day we're to eat unleavened bread. But look at this. On the first day you shall remove leaven out of your houses. Now, last year I raised this because I knew it would catch almost everybody out. You were all taught to be A students and you made sure that your house was all leaven free before the start of the Pesach. But that's not the instruction. It's actually very serious here in this instruction because the, the uh, antecedent of this is talking about being cut off from the house of Israel. On the first day, you shall remove leaven out of your houses. So you mean that we're actually on the first day supposed to spend that time to go through our toasters, our vacuums, our freezers, our home, we're supposed to look at our house and remove the leaven. And you are to do that on day one, not before, not after. If we are to honor this to Torah, you do it following the Pesach, the starting gun of the first day of unleavened. That one catches a lot of people out because we want to be in our good intentions, A eh, students, don't we? And so we make sure we're all ready for the Pesach. I've got all the leaven out of the house. And that's not what the Torah actually says. It might have been what you were taught. Well, why does that matter, Curtis? Well, it matters because Elohim said it did. Is there a reason why it matters? Yes. And goes on to say in Exodus 16, 17, on the first day you shall hold a holy convocation or assembly. This is why we gather for the Pesach meal together and we do this uh, River Shabbat Live because this is a part of gathering. And so you're supposed to gather in the homes. And so we do this from our home and encourage others to come from their home and to have this gathering with us. No work shall be done on those days. But what, every, but what everyone needs to eat, that alone may be prepared by you. Okay. All right. So that should end a lot of arguments that go on with a lot of the Talmud going on at this time of the year. But everyone needs to eat. That alone may be prepared by you. It's not work. And you shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. For on this very day, I brought your hosts out of the land. So on that day, the first day of Unleavened Bread, I brought you out of the land of Egypt. So he wants you to focus on the delivery from bondage. Now, you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a statue forever. Why is this important? Because as you're removing the leaven out of your house on day one, you are knowing and realizing as that leaven and as you're getting it out, you're realizing you are being set free. And the greater spiritual implication of that is you're being set free from your spiritual adultery. So is there any hidden message in the Torah in the week of unleavened bread? Do we have anything in there more for us to find than what we've done in the years leading up to this? Well, there's something quite special that occurs during the week of unleavened bread. It's called the feast, uh, first of the first fruits. Many of you would think of this as the wave offering. It is not a, uh, a high Sabbath in and of itself. And indeed, the, what they would do is they take the, uh, the first of the first fruits, the wave of the sheaf offerings, and bring this to the high priest. But it's a little bit more detailed than that. And there's something interesting in this that I believe is going to point to something for us to consider. So we've gone through, we've considered removing the spiritual adultery. We've gone through this. We've done this on day one. We can practically honor this now and to think about now, not just the what we're doing when we remove all this leaven from our house, but why are we doing it? What is this representing? What is this shadow picture? He's delivered us from bondage. Okay. Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land that I give you and reap its harvest. Okay. So this is around, remember we talked about the feast and this is the barley feast. Okay. 
This is the barley side shovel oat where we're uh, going to head into the wheat. And then, of course, in the fall and the spring, we're heading into the grapes and the figs and the pomegranates and the olives. It says this, when you come into the land, I will give you and reap its harvest. You shall bring the sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. And he shall wave the sheaf before Yah. Well, that's interesting. We don't have a temple. We don't have, you know, Messiah sitting on the throne. He's tarrying. How the heck does this first of the first fruits even matter, donkey? And you, so that you may be accepted. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So this is after the weekly Sabbath. By the way, there's no dispute there. If it was an appointed time or annual Sabbath, the scripture always states it. There's no argument here. This is the day after the weekly Sabbath. It would tell you otherwise. There's, people might uh, get into arguments on that every year. Don't buy into that. It means what it says, says what it means. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. Is there a first fruits hidden prophecy? This thing that maybe we don't really acknowledge. I'm just focused on don't eat leavened bread. Don't eat leavened bread for a week. I made it. You know, on the day after unleavened bread, what do we do? We grab that hamburger. <laughs> that and you're like, yes, I can eat my leaven again. And we celebrate stuffing our faces with leavened food. Is there something going on here? Do we skip over this one a little bit? I'm going to suggest that we do. Because, well, it's not a high Sabbath, Curtis. It's not the weekly Sabbath. You know, yeah, we don't have a priest anymore. Hmm. But if you start to look at the why of all of this, is there something more, in, more to do with this? Let's read on. In Leviticus and the Torah in 23, 12, 13, is there something very interesting when we read this? And on the day when you wave the sheaf, so we're referring to the first of the first fruits occurring during the week of unleavened bread, you shall offer a male lamb, a year old without blemish. Okay, so it is fallen. It's fallen. The lamb is fallen, but it is without blemish. Otherwise, think sanctified. You shall bring a male lamb who is sanctified. Now, we know this points to Messiah. This is one of the hidden prophecies of Messiah. But we're all familiar with that one, or we should be. That this is all a part of all speaking of Messiah and his great plan of redemption. So this is Messiah in a sanctified state, but still in a fallen sanctified state. He was the only sinless lamb. He's not in a glorified state here. So this is what it's representing. Now look at this. And the grain offering, it shall be two tenths of an ephah, a fine flour with oil and a food offering to Yah with a pleasing aroma. And this is starting to be a big deal, even though we're not on a high Sabbath. Why is this a big deal? We now know the Messiah is definitely starting or is involved with this first of the first fruits during this week of unleavened. Now there's this grain offering. It's very specific, two tenths of an ephah. What's going on here? Why is he giving this such detail? And then I often say to people, now go, let's read more. Let's go read further. And the drink offering with it shall be of wine, a fourth of a hin. What is going on here? Why is this so special? And why is it in the middle of the week of unleavened bread? We already know, though, that this first of the first fruits is pointing to Messiah. And we know that this was given to the high priest. We know the high priest points to Messiah. So a male sheep without blemish, sanctified. A shekel, and this is at the time of when this was written. And it's referring to specifically a silver shekel. So think silver, okay, sanctified. A gold shekel, think glorified. Okay, and so there's something that's going, this, uh, these whole shadow pictures are through. And this is referring to the basic silver shekel of the day. And this equaled roughly three to four days wages, depending on, you know, uh, uh, you know, the arguments from the various scholars. These were the wages for common labor in ancient biblical times, approximately one shekel to purchase a sheep in ancient biblical times. 
So it would take three days wages to get this thing. Generally, back in that time, you would work three days, all right, to do that. The grain offering. So this is interesting. We're in the week of unleavened bread. We got the barley, and so this is all concerning that which is unleavened. Again, a shekel equaled roughly three to four days of wages for common labor in ancient biblical times. This would get you about 12 quarts of dry barley at this time. It would cost you approximately the one shekel. Now, this omer is about a tenth of an ephah. So we think counting the omer and all the sorts of things, but an omer is about a tenth of an ephah. That's approximately worth two dry quarts of barley. So two tenths would be four quarts of dry barley. In income terms, roughly today, this would be about one working day's wage, one to two days working day's wages. And this would be wages before tax and annual gross income. It's referring to the harvest. So many of us aren't harvesting our wheat and whatnot, but this was literally income in their hands that they're giving to the high priest. And they're literally doing this on the first of first fruits. Now, there's going to be some very interesting instructions that surround this. Basically, and you don't get to cheat on this and whatnot. You don't get to count, you know, the annual uh, weekly Sabbath or even the Roman days off. These are actual labor days. Roughly, that would be about 260 days for people. So think your annual gross salary, um, uh, your annual gross salary before tax, you know, divided by 260, and you're roughly going to get around what this is actually costing them of what they brought to the priest in today's terms, whatever that would be for your life. When you give this offering, and what I do and what Pip and I do every year, I can't give it to my high priest. He's sitting on the throne physically, literally. I can't go through a process in the temple and the high priest and whatnot, literally in physical modern state of Israel today. So how am I supposed to actually do this? And what I'm going to say to you, and what we're seeing in the community is that you're starting to see, and just like Paul said, that we would grow to the stature and maturity of Messiah. And every year, what Pip and I do is we look to a brother or sister who we are seeing Messiah in. And we will make that offering, not to them, but to Messiah in them. If they accept it, then is Messiah in them accepting it? You see, is it possible that we can actually honor Messiah in that which we fellowship with, that which we know, that which we see Messiah in? And if you're giving truly to Messiah, then you are honoring this according to all of the word. But you need to walk with someone to know whether you see Messiah in them. You're going to see where discipleship comes into this, being a community, everything else. This isn't just random. This isn't just all, well, I gave to somebody on the street who was in need. We'll talk about that a little bit later. And more specifically in the message uh, next Shabbat. This is actually speaking about that which you see Messiah. This is not regular tithing, all that sort of thing. This is actually an offering that you're coming. And you're not to be empty-handed, as we spoke about. Now, again, I'm not trying to say to anybody... Uh, you know, if you if you don't do this, you've not been doing this. But over the years, this is the true conviction that the Father has given us. Donkey, it's real. And I want you to learn something. And I have learned and been able to bless a brother or sister every year because we are starting to take the matter seriously. I will give to Messiah. And I can do it. And the reason why I can do it is because it is the weak is the day after the weekly Sabbath, the day which you can't buy or sell. Notice what day it is after the Sabbath, the day I can give to someone. 
No coincidence to this. Here's where it gets interesting when we keep reading with the wine. I'm going to suggest to you something that's very interesting here. A shekel silver again would buy you a hin of wine. What's a hin during the ancient Babylonian times? This would equal, and again, this translates pretty much to the Roman times almost 2,000 years ago in their weights and measures. This is roughly around six liters, 1.6 U.S. gallons. This is what is very interesting about this hidden prophecy. The amount of blood in an adult's body can vary according to age and size, uh, size to be sure. But on average, though, a human adult will have five to six liters of blood circulating in their blood system. One fourth of a kin is approximately 1.5 liters that we are to bring or what they were to bring according to the structure of the Torah. This is exactly the amount of blood loss when a human being starts to die. If you think that to be a coincidence, I have a bridge to sell you. At two liters, you're dead. So let me get this straight. All in the first of the first fruits. Everything here is to Messiah, about Messiah, for Messiah. This thing we tend to skip over in this week of unleavened bread while we're making sure we don't eat any leaven. Because we're focused on what not to do. The Messiah sacrifice, the male, the male sheep. Approximately three days labors. Think three nights, days in the grave. The barley grain offering, approximately one day labor, the wave offering to Messiah. Think resurrection day. This is going to come to an interesting connection on in the fall Modin. The wine offering, again, this day's labor or this fourth of the kin representing the exact amount of blood that it would take for him to start dying on the ancient tough. Now we may not have our lamb is sitting on the throne and he's alive and he has already spilt his blood, but this grain offering, we can present to Messiah. Messiah in someone we truly know and walk with. I was stunned when the father shared this reality of just how much this appointed time in this first of the first fruits is actually and truly pointing to Messiah. It's not just the high priest. It is the sacrifice of the high priest. And it is accurate to the actual amount of blood that would be spilled in that offering that is instructed in Torah. How did the Pharisees and the Sadducees not see this almost 2,000 years ago? Here's your little fast during the week of unleavened. If you take this one seriously, in Leviticus 23, 14, and you shall eat neither bread nor, nor grain parts, which was also done at that time of the year, or fresh until the same day. So within the same day, until you've brought the offering to Elohim. Do you know when I fast during the week of unleavened bread? I try to make that fast as quick as possible. <laughs> so I get my grain offering to Messiah and someone. <laughs> so I can get back to my leavened bread. Do you see what it's saying? Let your stomach, let your flesh be the reminder of what's actually going on here to prompt you to give to Messiah. And then get back to eating your unleavened bread, as it says every day. So there is a little time here where you would do an intermittent fast. By the way, the health benefits of intermittent fasting, my wife will tell you all about that. But it's actually giving this instruction. This is a statue throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Okay, so we're not to stop this one. What's going on? I'm the house of Israel. I make sure I don't eat unleavened bread. 
I know the wave offering is Yeshua the high priest. Move on. But is there actually here and do? Is the Shema actually captured in every single one of his appointed times? For me, in Pip's journey, in our journey, he's absolutely telling us. Oh, I'm Torah observant. Well, I hope you're the judge of that when this is all over. Every year I get reminded how I'm not Torah observant. And that I need the very hidden message of his blood in these prophecies to cover my missing mark. Every year I realize I am not Torah observant. But the blood, the hin, the fourth of the hin that was spilled on that ancient tav, that price that was paid, is helping me to have my faith journey, is allowing me to have my faith journey. It is the only thing that keeps me alive to have my faith journey. Mark 12, 15, 17. So Yeshua is dealing with this, but knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, why put me to test, to the test? So he's got the Pharisees and some of the Herodians now, and he's going to address them now in a very specific language. And I'm going to suggest to you, it's the first of the first fruits language. I'm going to suggest to you, he is speaking, literally answering them in an appointed time of unleavened bread, because it's about to be fulfilled physically upon the earth, literally by him. And so he's very specific with something. And they said to them, why put me to the test? I could just see him going, why are you doing this? You know the word, you know Torah. What's going on here? Bring me a denarius. Let me look at it. And they brought him one. And he said to them, whose likeness is on this inscription? Who's on this Gentlemen, high priests, Pharisees, Rhodians, who's on it? They said to him, Caesar. And Yeshua said to them, render to Caesar that are Caesar's and to Elohim the things that are Elohim. In other words, he's saying to them, they marveled at him because you know what he just told them? You don't even have a valid question. If you knew your Torah, it is all before tax. It is all to do with the harvest of your fields. It has nothing to do with the bondage you are facing in Rome. But by the way, I plan on delivering you from that. But I want you to think about what this is. He's literally just told them, you don't even have a legitimate question. See this face? Well, give to him what he's demanding. Your priority you of the religious system, you of the faith, your priority was Torah. No wonder he was getting, it appears anyway, if I'm to personify his words here and his actions, it appears he's actually getting short with them. And we're, on the, we're about to see the actual week of unleavened be fulfilled physically. And they're asking him questions that relate to the very instructions and the things that point to him within it. They don't have a, they don't have a clue. How is that possible? Don't they have all the what's so down pat? Is there any other hidden prophecies in the week of my level? Bit? I can suggest to you there's something else that's interesting in here. Isn't the... Week of unleavened bread, seven days. I'm going to suggest to you that it's actually eight. Now, I'm doing it this year. I went through toasters, vacuums, freezers, drive throughs This year, I've decided I'm giving a heads up. So this isn't about catching people out now. There is something very interesting to do with all of this. And just as we know, the fall Moedim are eight days, are seven days of the wedding feast, and then we celebrate the last great day at the end of it. Eight days. I'm going to suggest to you it's also eight days. 
in the spring loading. So no one gets caught out this year. I'm going to tell you ahead of time. I wish someone had done that for me at some point in my life. In Exodus 12, 18, 20, in the first month from the 14th day of the month at the evening, just if everybody's, again, if you're struggling when a Sabbath starts and when it doesn't, it's the evening. Okay. There's no argument here. Sundown is the start of the new day. You shall eat unleavened bread until the 21st day of the month at evening, where it ends and it starts. The Torah is very clear on this. All these arguments going on in the body is just silliness. For seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. I'm either dealing with a contradiction here now, at this point, now that we've gone through this, based on the instructions on what to do to look at what is right, what is pure, what is holy. So there's either a contradiction here or there's something that we're missing. If I'm removing unleavened bread as instructed by Torah on day one, can that be true? Do you know there was a brother this year and I smiled and it was written to me. They'd actually figured this out or figured it out enough to ask the question. And I said, I'm going to be speaking about this. And I smiled. I said, yeah. This is interesting. So contradiction or hidden prophecy. If I have removed the leaven in my house on day one of unleavened bread, how did I fulfill that? For seven days, no leaven is to be found in your house. It's got nothing to do now with eating unleavened bread for seven days. And it's interesting. We get to the end of unleavened bread and we go, many people go out shopping. Hi, Sabbath's over. Go fill your house up with leaven. Let me, let me just read this again. For seven days, no leaven is to be found in your houses. You couldn't do that on day one. If anyone eats what is leavened, that person would be cut off from the congregation of Israel. Whoa. Oh, I'm Torah observant. Really? Look at this. Whether he's a sojourner, whether we've come in from our scattered realities or a native of the land, you shall eat nothing leavened. In all your dwelling places, you shall eat unleavened bread. If I can't bring bread and back, leaven back into my house, Am I looking at a seven day or an eight day? Do you know what Pip and I do now every year? We finish our week of unleavened bread and we continue to eat it because we don't go shopping the day after and fill the house up with all the leaven. Why? Because I actually can't honor Torah. I'm either looking at a contradiction or I'm looking at what the plain reading of Torah says. It's not mixing this with anything else. It's saying as a part of honoring unleavened, you'll, you will achieve seven days with no leaven to be found in your houses. You can't do that unless you go into an eighth day. I believe you're seeing a hidden prophecy of something that relates to the thousand year reign of Messiah that is connected in the spring modine. I believe what you're actually seeing is that which has got the leaven out of the house. He plans on having a thousand years of rain with a bridal governance that is spiritually unleavened. We have two eight day feasts here. That is where he has led me. And when I saw this and I saw that you were pointing to something to do with this lasting great final rain, and that you are looking for something that remains unleavened, you are going to have an unleavened governance upon this earth spiritually. So the key instructions are not to eat unleavened bread for seven days. Yes. Uh, sorry, not, um, uh, not to eat leavened bread. I've got that reversed on here. And not to eat 
uh, and to uh, not to eat any leavened bread for seven days, to eat unleavened bread during the actual seven days. However, then it says we are to ensure we have the no presence left in our home for seven days. The only way that can be achieved is this hidden prophecy. Contradiction or prophecy in plain sight. This year, I wasn't going to catch anyone else out. But I want you to know where we have been led according to Torah and why we do it according to Torah. I don't believe there's any other way to honor this, but to uncover that hidden message. He is going to look for the people that remain spiritually unleavened. In Micah 412, it says this, it shall come to pass in the latter days that in the mountain, the house of Yah shall be established at the highest of the mountains. It shall be lifted up upon the hills and the people shall flow to it. And the many nations shall come. Come, let us go up to the mountain of Yah, to the house of the Elohim of Yah. And he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his path, his righteousness. No spiritual adultery, for out of Zion shall go forth the Torah and the word of Yah from Jerusalem. I believe you're referring to the prophecy of the last great day. You are referring, it is referring to these last days, the thousand year reign, a spiritually unleavened bridal government. Get this, no more separation of church and state in the thousand years, just so everybody's aware. <laughs> we, have, we, have, we have a king that plans on running it as a theocracy. Time for a righteous king. Not a republic, not a democracy, not communism, not nothing. He's running a theocracy. And the theocracy is the faith living upon the earth. Unleavened. Look at this. Micah 4, 3. He shall judge between the many peoples and shall decide the disputes for the, for the strong nations far away. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. No more war under a righteous king. They may still have the ability to miss the mark as they're fallen. There may still be sin, but his righteousness is going to go forth. They are going to live in unleavened administration. And then I saw the throne seated on those who had the authority to judge. Mm, who are they? It's a bridal governance. It was committed. And also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded, the testimony of Yeshua for the word of Elohim, those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on its forehead or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Messiah for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. So if you're not a part of Yom Teruah, you're in the grave until the end of that thousand years. And then you'll face the great white throne judgment. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Blessed and holy are those who are part of Yom Teruah or the Feast of Trumpets, literal fulfillment. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of Elohim and of Messiah, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. An unleavened bridal government that will go forth his Torah from Jerusalem. Who's outside the new Jerusalem, who does not enter in by the 12 gates, all with the names of the 12 tribes of the house of Israel on it. Those who are going through their sanctification, those who still need to go through their process. Blessed are those who wash the robes, for they may have right to the tree of life, literally to the throne of Yeshua HaMashiach. And they may enter the city by the gates, the 12 gates, and the 12 tribes of Israel. They are going to be in to come and go. Outside are the unclean, those who are sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices the falsehood. These are outside. They are being ministered to as a result. They are still in a fallen state, and they will still need to accept Messiah, and they will still be put in a situation in the time domain where they will make a sovereign choice. There's a big job to do. There's a big, big job coming. And that very time, this last and great final age of what a room has purchased is actually hidden 
in my opinion, and captured within the instructions in Torah concerning the week of unleavened bread. So the hidden Messiah prophecy summary, sinless male lamb, we all got that one. We all know that it's referring to him and his fulfillment of it. The blood wine. Actually, this point to be honoring. I want you to think about me as the lamb, but I also want you to think of the price that was paid for you. This fourth of a hin. The blood loss. The bread of resurrected life. The risen high priest. Messiah in another. The unleavened house. Goes on for one more day. Spiritually unleavened bridal government. Yeshua is the Messiah, King and the High Priest. And this is captured in all the framework of his appointed times. All speak to him, all reveal him. And all praise and all of our honoring of the Torah and his instructions of righteousness should be to him. Is there any more hidden prophecies in the Messiah in the week of unleavened bread? Yes, but this one is a really big one and it links to the spring and fall appointed times. The Yom Kippurim atonement connection. It's so big that we're going to need to get the leaven out of our houses. And I'll be sharing this this year at Yom Kippurim and atonement. I will not be sharing it today. This one is, is what links the two in this incredible time. And what we're seeing on Levin, there is captured in here a hidden prophecy that connects both the fall and the spring, that connects both the groom and the bride. But it is one that I believe needs our houses with the leaven removed to hear it and to see it and to receive it. So, this disclosure of the king, as we finish this up today, and as he's drawing near into, uh, into Jerusalem, he's about to allow himself, and he's on, his, he's on the donkey, and uh, his beloved, I believe, family donkey, and in tows this wild colt. And as he's coming in, he's drawing near already on the way down the Mount of Olives. The, and the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and to praise Elohim with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of Yah. He is actually going to allow himself now to be identified literally by the people. And they're going to establish him as king. Shalom in heaven and glory in the, high, in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. What's going on? This is blasphemy. They're actually acknowledging you. He's about, he is now on the approach. He's about to actually fulfill this almost 2,000 years ago, physically in the flesh. And the actual religious system, which knew the Torah, taught the Torah, practiced the Torah, and was in, in overseeing the religious system for the house of Israel, were the ones yelling, rebuke your disciples. And his answer to them is, I tell you, if these were silent, he's referring to these ones that are praising and are getting this, the very stones would cry out. In other words, the punishment of being stoned to death for breaking the Torah. He's not just making a point. They're breaking the Torah if they don't acknowledge it right now, because what? When he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it and saying, this is literally what he's doing. Would that you, even you had known on this day, the things that make for shalom but now they are hidden from your eyes. The very religious system in charge of the Torah, practicing the Torah, administering the Torah, is the very system that is now not to literally be able to acknowledge the literal fulfillment of the very thing that they were in charge of administering. And they're going to reject their Messiah, the hidden the crypto in the Greek there, to hide, conceal, escape notice, to conceal. Unbelievable. Can leaven 
affect our hearing, our sight? Can our knowledge puff us up? Can our, our even our good intentions to make sure that we get it right and don't do this and don't do that and don't touch this? Is the focus exactly throwing us off just like Paul warned? Get your focus on the right thing. The rest of it is going to, I'm going to wash you. I'm going to clean you up. Just keep your focus on the right things. Sanctified man walking, not a glorified. Our Messiah did not cheat on this appointed times. He literally bled. He literally died. He literally could be tempted. He did not cheat. Yet he remained sanctified and therefore became the worthy lamb. He was born into a fallen state, but he overcame it. And scripture warns that which say he didn't are of the adversary. Isaiah 56, I always mention it this year in the teachings. It disturbed me so greatly many years ago when I realized what I was really reading. I gave my back to those who strike. He took his lashes for us and my cheeks. To those who pull out the beard. They ripped the beard off his face. I hid not my face from the disgrace and the spitting. Mark 15, 17, 20. And they clothed him in a purple cloak and twisting together a crown of thorns. By the way, I believe that to be a wild almond tree. I'm going to speak about this in the fall Moedim. They put it on him and they began to salute him. Hail the king of the Yehudim. And they were striking his head and with a reed and spitting on him and kneeling down to give homage to him. And when they had mocked him, and they stripped him of his purple cloak and his own clothes on him. And they led him out to crucify him. He allowed it all. He allowed everything that occurred that day. And he could have put a stop to it at any time. Why did our Elohim do such a thing? Is there a great plan of redemption which he is going to complete and he is doing it because he is fulfilling his dream, his goal, his purpose? Is he setting something up for eternity? So what can we do to honor his word at the appointed time of unleavened bread? Remove the Christian and modern Judeo Talmud and traditions, our communion and set of traditions. You can do that. Eat your Passover meal in haste. It's not some great celebration to get drunk at. Do not eat any unleavened bread for seven days. Eat leaven bread for seven days. Remove the leaven from your house on day one, not before. All these things mean something. Remember your first fruits offering to Messiah. Remember this. Can you give to Messiah and someone else when you actually see him? And can you do this from your harvest? Again, it's not tithes. I'm not talking about our normal tithes. It's not talking about giving to the poor. This is actually giving to Messiah. Keep your house leaven free for seven days. It means you're heading for a day eight. 
if you're actually to achieve that simple instruction there right at the end of all of it. Maybe this year we don't go running out to the supermarket or line up as soon as the sun goes down so we can have our hamburger. Reflect on the heart matter and the why of it all to do this during this time. These are the things we can do. These are the things we should do and we can focus on him, our Messiah, our high priest and our king. What about the gleanings from the harvest? We're going to talk about that next week as a part of what we're doing. We're going to be looking at the 144,000 next week. We're going to look at some things in Ruth's. There's gleanings that are associated with both the first of the first fruits harvest and Shavuot. Let's finish up here. A time to look in our own house over this time coming up. I encourage you all, do the best that you can. Take seriously that there is a Torah for us. There is a king on a throne. And it's all living now. And this is not just a what. This is now a why. I believe his bride is going to care about the why. She's going to move on. She's going to say, you know what? I'm done with this leaven. I want to honor my bridegroom. She's going to care. Our boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Cleanse out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, as you really are unleavened. For Messiah, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Let us therefore celebrate the festival or the feast, the Moedim, not with the old leaven, but the leaven, the leaven, this leaven of malice and evil, our traditions, our Talmud. But with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Truth before who? Before him. This is not a week to be looking at everyone else. This is the week now that I have to look. I share my journey with you and have done so in this teaching. Because in this community, I feel like the chief of sinners. But I have to be honest with you. Everything you're seeing is the slow revealing of my journey in the faith over years. The mistakes I've made, the things I haven't seen, the things I have seen. And every year, I now sense that it is a time when I look before my Messiah and I say, okay, is there still anything in this house? Is there something that is still here defiling you? I'm encouraging you Maybe just you too could do the same. Just see if there's something there, your king, your high priest, your Messiah wants to reveal and to show you. And praise him, honor him. We can honor. He's alive. He's living. And yes, he was the lamb. And yes, it was his blood. But we can still honor him. Now, in a living king on the throne, our high priest. And we can do that by honoring Messiah and one another. And I encourage you to just take these things and ponder them. And take seriously now, this week ahead. And I don't mean say take seriously because you haven't. I mean take seriously in the sense of it being your house in a repentance before Messiah. We've all doing the best that we can. We're all trying to do the best that we can. He knows that. This is the reason for his blood. But maybe now's the time as we come to the end of the age and this world is shaking. Maybe now's the time for us to go, you know what? 
Elohim doesn't need my defense. He needs my, he's wanting or desiring my repentance. And those are the things that we can think about. And I encourage you to look now at your own house. Not my house, not your neighbor's house, not those of your fellowship's house, not those of your discipleship with, not everyone else, because they're not your standard. Let's honor this in the way he wanted us to. For those who'd like to join live at the Pesach, the starting gun of the week of unleavened bread, come and join us and we'll go through the Luke account and, uh, and we can just, just honor this now, not from just the what perspective, but come together with that sincerity and truth and maybe just come with the heart of why. Amen. Let's finish there. And for those, uh, we're going to come back with a, a Q and A here shortly. Um, and I look forward to also seeing those of you who want to join us live for the Pesach meal.